If I uh, asked you to name a disciple just off the top of your head, who would you say? Peter. Peter, right? Pretty quickly. You know, Peter's mentioned 184 times in the, in the NIV New Testament alone, more than any other disciple. And as we read in the gospel, we learn about Peter. We learn that, that Peter was a fisherman who, along with his brother Andrew and Jesus found them and called them to follow me, as Jesus said. They immediately dropped their nets and followed Jesus, and the world would never be the same. Peter's life as a disciple was one of glorious highs and terrible lows at the same time. He was the one disciple who got out of the boat to walk on water at Jesus' invitation, but also the one who sank when doubt overcame him. He was the first disciple who confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, but the same one who moments later the Lord called Satan when he rebuked him. He was the one disciple who claimed that he would follow Jesus anywhere, even to death, but the one disciple who so publicly and explicitly denied even knowing Jesus. So we see in Peter this lovable walking contradiction which perhaps is a picture of us all, filled with the love of God and a desire to follow Jesus, but still so human, so frail, so weak, so unpredictable, but still so remarkable. Today, as we begin a four-part section of our newest sermon series entitled Acts, the minister's message, mission, and method of the church, our focus will be on Peter. And our prayer today is that as we study how God used him, we can be inspired to see how God is awesome and inspired to see how he could use people like us. Will you join me in our scripture reading this morning? It's in the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one had heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully. To what I say. Let's pray together. Lord, our desire today is indeed to listen carefully to what your minister would say to us. And God, as Mike comes to share, Lord, the message of or the ministry of Peter and who he is, may that bring us inspiration. Lord, may it humble us at the, the knowledge that you use men and women who are imperfect but who love you. Lord, may our time in this book through Acts, Lord, in in, in this study, bring us to a place, God, where we can be more sure of that love that you have for us. As Mike comes, God, fill him with boldness today. Fill him with your Spirit's power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So glad to see you all here at worship today. I was thrilled to see that blanket offering. When my dad was still alive, uh, he and my mom would often go down to the Umcor Depot to, at uh, Baldwin, Louisiana, and one of Lowell's jobs, my father's job, was to bundle blankets uh, in 150-pound uh, bundles and send them off. So I know that thousands of those blankets go out every year to places in the U.S. Like, you know, we sent a lot to Joplin, Missouri last year and, of course, different places in the world. So we're grateful that you gave uh, to those. You know, I, I get a lot of stuff forwarded to me on the email, and a lot of times I uh, look at it and say, oh, that's cute, and, you know, it's nice. And then every once in a while, somebody hits you something with something. And I said, you know, I should probably tell the folks that. <clears throat> this week, one of you, you're here today right now in this service, actually, sent me an email. It went like this. The church was full. And a fellow pulled into a parking spot outside, parked his car, and as he got out, another man pulled up, rolled down his window and said, look, I come to this church every week and you took my parking spot. <laughs> Wouldn't be that hard here, would it? <laughs> he went into the sanctuary. He was excited to see that there was a big crowd in the sanctuary, and he went to sit down, and when he sat down, a man came up and stood beside him. And said, look, you took my seat. You took my place. He went to Sunday school because he wanted to learn more about what was going on in that church. And he went into Sunday school and there was a room of 24 chairs circled around there. And there was an empty seat when he got there. So he went and he sat in it and a woman came in and said, sir, you've taken my place. So I've sit here every year for 20 years. I've been sitting there. When the man got up, pulled his hair back, they could see that he had cuts on his forehead and holes in his hands. One of the men said to him, what happened to you? He said, I took your place. The Lord Jesus takes our place at every piece of the way. He speaks into our hearts and he makes us ready to welcome more in because you see we already know he took our place so we need to make sure that we're open to receive others in. I, I thought that was such a precious email. It has uh, everything and nothing to do with the talk I'm going to give uh, <laughs> but you get it right. Amen? Amen. Now I don't often ask this at 8 30 because I noticed at 9.45 and 11, and there's a few of you here at 8.30 that like to furiously scribble notes, but I'm going to share with you, and it's going to be on a slide in a minute, something that I think that you want to write down. I'm just telling you this because I wrote it down, and I don't usually, I was cranking it into my phone the first time I heard it, so get your smartphone out, get a piece of paper out, get a pencil out. You're going to want to write this down because if you've got a grandkid that is coming up in life, if you've got a child living in your home, if you need thoughtful process in your own home, you're going to want to write this word down and... <clears throat> The little acrostic thing goes with it because I'm telling you what, I, I do. Wednesday night it changed my life. I have to say that. It, it definitely made an impact when I heard it for the first time. And this is how it came to us. Keith brought in a friend of his to 412 and he talked about his life story. He's, what is he, 25 now? 25 years old? Our speaker? Something like that. He gave a talk about how the first part of his life was all focused on the right thing and then a group of decisions that lasted less than one evening transformed who he was, made everyone look at him differently than he ever wanted to be looked at, and made him rethink his future. Now, here's the word. We've got it on a slide. We've got that first slide. It's called choices. Write down the word choices, and this is what was given to us. I'm going to use this today. Choose him, of course, Jesus. Choose him over I changes every situation. Choosing him over I changes every situation. Think about it. No matter where you're at, whether you're in somebody's space at Sunday school, whether you're in somebody's parking spot, whether you're at work, whether you're at lunch after this, wherever you're at, if you cho are choosing him over I, it will change every situation. It will change who you are in this situation. It will change the impact you leave in this situation and it will change the lives that you meet in there. Now, I tell you this <clears throat> to get to the talk today. 
Today, as Pastor Keith uh, eloquently said as he began, we are celebrating the Apostle Peter. I was really surprised when he said, name a disciple, and no one said, Bartholomew, Thaddeus. <laughs> Come on, where are you disciple people? You know those things. But we all do. We come Peter first. You know why? Because Peter is representative of the disciples for us. When Peter speaks in a lot of Gospels, what did you say, 184 times he's listed? Thaddeus, Bartholomew, poor like five or six, right? Um, when Peter speaks, he's representative of the disciples. He's representative of us. And we're going to address the apostle Peter because he made choices in his life. Eventually, Peter decided to choose him over I and allow every situation to be changed in his life. Choices led Peter to preach the first Christian sermon, which we'll get to next week. Choices lead the Catholics today to say that their leader, their pope, is a direct successor of Peter, this Peter, the apostle. Choices lead us to place Peter as the hero of our faith, one of the great leaders of our faith. And this is how it starts. Peter's fishing. Not surprising, he wasn't a fisherman on the 16th Avenue Bridge that would, from time to time, go down there and throw a line in the water. He didn't do it for sport. Peter was a fisherman. Every day, it wouldn't be surprising to find Peter at the Sea of Galilee with his brother getting ready to fish. So Peter finds, or Jesus finds Peter where Peter normally is. It's interesting how Jesus finds us where we normally are. Hear me? Jesus finds Peter where he normally is. And the first words, which incidentally are the last words that Peter, Jesus says to Peter, the first words that Jesus says to Peter are these. Follow me. Follow me. And he enthusiastically gets up and follows Jesus. He enthusiastically follows, but he doesn't completely follow. Now here's what I mean by that. We all have those friends, don't we? Y'all have a friend that says, hey, you want to go to the Cubs game today? And they're like, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. We're driving down the road with your friends like, this is awesome, we're going to the Cubs game. Hey, isn't your daughter getting married today? Oh, yeah, I didn't think that through all the way. You know, I, I mean, you know, you have those friends that are like enthusiastic. Hey, do you want to do this? They're like, yeah. I was like, aren't you having knee surgery today? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. You know, I mean, we have friends like that, right, that enthusiastically follow things or enthusiastically want to do things, but they're not complete in, 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 all the way down in, the, in their attention. And that's kind of what Keith was leaning on. You know, here's Jesus and Peter after Peter's following Jesus for a while, and they're walking with the other disciples down the, down the road, and Jesus says, who do people say I am? And Jesus said, Peter says, oh, they say Elijah. They, they, he says, but Peter, who do you say I am? You are the Son of God. The living Messiah. And Jesus says back to him, Peter, you are the rock, and upon you the church shall have its foundation. And Jesus went on to say, and you know, Peter, the living Son of God must suffer, be rejected, be scorned by evil men, and be killed. No, says Peter. And Jesus' response is, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. So he goes from right to wrong because he didn't, he enthusiastically knows who Jesus is, but he doesn't completely know how to follow him. And Jesus says to Peter and his friends, hey, just pray with me for a little while. Just, just stay here awake while I go over there and pray. Just be alert. Let temptation not come into your soul. And when Jesus goes and prays, he comes back to Peter and the boys and he finds them <laughs> fast asleep right there in the garden. And Jesus says three times, Peter, three times you'll deny me. And of course he does. Jesus is crucified. Resurrection happens. And Peter's fishing again. He's there at the Sea of Galilee, fishing where he had done so many times. And the resurrected Christ comes to him. And again says to Peter, follow me. Even at the lakeside, after seeing the whole Jesus story unfold, 
seeing him raise people from the dead, seeing him give the blind sight, giving him the lame, the ability to walk after he'd heard these, uh, seeing the 5,000 fed, after he'd heard the sermons that were beyond splendor, after he'd felt Jesus touch his heart so much, after he'd seen the whole Jesus story, even still then, his following is not total. It is, it is still not complete. Reservations and fears still plague Peter. And then the Ascension Day comes. And the disciples come to Jesus with this question. You'll see it in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. <clears throat> they gathered around. <clears throat> no, look at this. They gathered around him and asked him. This is the scripture we looked at last week. Lord, are you? See where their attention is. Their attention is still on Jesus. Lord, well, it would be. He was resurrected, so that makes sense. But look where they're putting responsibility for the kingdom. He said, are you at this time, going to restore to the kingdom of Israel. It, it, you know, such as it was, is this the day you're going to flip the world? Is today the day? You know, we've seen all this. Now we've been together 40 days after you're resurrected. But is this the day that you're going to make Israel the triumphant uh, kingdom in the world? Is this the day that we come to power? Is this the day that you are going to make this happen? And look at what Jesus responds to it. His response is in Acts chapter 1. He says... You, the collective us, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You know, you have to say, you will be my witnesses to Cedar Rapids, Marion, Hiawatha, Alburnett, Central City. You know, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And of course, he's saying, I will power it. I'll power it, but you'll do the work. I'll enable you, but you're the foot soldiers. And let me tell you this, it's bigger than you think. It's not just Israel. It's the end of the earth. It's even where the bad people live, according to what the Jewish disciples might have thought. And questions abound. And you know what Jesus does? He leaves. He ascends into heaven. Right then. He goes up into heaven. And the disciples are left with this message. And so they do what Jesus told them to do. Earlier in that, in that chapter, he told them to stay together. So when the day of Pentecost comes, there are all the disciples gathered together in the house. This is a story that we read a few minutes ago. The disciples and Peter are all in the right place. And then all these signs and sounds, the rushing wind, this sound like lightning and thunder coming in, these tongues of fire come down and light on people's heads. And the word of God is made clear to anyone who had ears to hear. Regardless of what language they spoke, regardless of what dialogue they carried to themselves, the disciples, fairly unlearned men, were enabled to go out and speak to people in the language that they could hear. You know, I, I take an aside here to say, this is why we bought these new pew Bibles. I mean, we bought this so that the Word of God may be made clear to people. So if you have people that it needs to be made clear to, Take one with you and take it home. It's, it's, a, it's a thrill every week to be, relation, really, uh, you know, to be replacing several pew Bibles. But Peter's enthusiastic following when the Pentecost day comes. He'd always been enthusiastic. He'd always loved Jesus. He'd always wanted to follow him. But now, for the first time, Peter's following is made complete because he's received the Holy Spirit. And look, at, see, I think in Peter's ministry... The next sentence that you're going to look at on the screen is the most important thing that ever happens. Look what happens in Acts chapter 2, 14. Then Peter stood up. Peter stood up. He who had just seven weeks previously timidly shrunk into the darkness of denial, who had, who had run away, stands up and commands attention. Not only does he stand up, but he says, men of Jerusalem, listen to me. And at the center of the opposition's camp, Peter shouts his sermon. If you, if you read this in some 
uh, older Bibles. Now, and in his thought process, you know this, he was all in, he was complete. You might mock and humiliate me just as you did my master. You might arrest me and beat me just as you did my master. You might throw together a midnight trial where you use lies and tell them as if they're true, just like you did my master. You might kill me just as you did my master, but this day I will stand for him and I shall testify him because he has need of me and I am his witness. Peter, now endowed with the Holy Spirit, cannot be denied his ministry. Jesus kept sending him out to do stuff and half the time Peter would fail. Peter would feel, fail at half of these things because he had not yet been able, enabled to do his ministry. But now the power to really follow Christ is replaced. It replaces fear and trepidation. And from henceforward, his life will always be centered on choices. Choosing him over I, changing every situation. I love this. I don't love this quote. I just know it's true. Charles Caleb Colton wrote, this was sent to me this week too. Men, and I'll add women, will, write, will wrangle for religion. Men and women will write for their religion. Men and women will fight for their religion. Men and women will die for their religion. Men and women will do anything but live for it. Astonishing, isn't it? We claim it to be our center core, and it's so hard. And here it is. You see, Peter began now for the first time to live for it. And his whole ministry, Pastor Keith and I are going to teach you about, was to demand it and demonstrate it. He demands it of others, and he demonstrates it forward. You see, faith is something to be seen in our lives. I, I know that Peter would have no ability to understand this conversation I had about, about 10 years ago. I had just conducted a funeral, and a fellow came up to me and said, he said this, he says, you know, he said, I worked right next to Jim, right Right over the cubicle wall. I saw him every day when we went to lunch. I saw him all the time, and we communicated during the day. I saw him every day, and I never knew he was a Christian. There was no indicator of this in his life. I'll never forget that because I thought, how could that be? You know, Peter couldn't even understand that, that kind of a sentence. How could someone be a Christian? How could someone claim Christ at the center of their life and be next to someone for 10 years and they have no idea that you had any investment in Christ at all? Peter tells us all the way through, and his sermons are going to tell us all the way through Acts at different places, that your life should be nothing but an indicator that Jesus is your Lord. Your life should be nothing but a beacon to the fact that Jesus is your Lord, and no matter whether you're at work or at your dining table or out in the high V or, or wherever you go shopping, your, your life should always be a beacon and indicator that Jesus Christ not only is the Lord, but he's your Lord in his life. It, it would be something he could just not understand because of what he knew and what he had experienced. Faith for Peter is something that you not only uh, exude from your living, but you also speak it. Peter's tongue, once he began, once he received the Holy Spirit, was never stilled again. And, and ours should not be stilled either because, you see, our Jesus' intention is that through our witnesses, the world shall be transformed. I, I told you during Lent that my discipline was to listen to a sermon every day, either live or in the internet. And I, I listened, and I know Keith listened to the same sermon this week by a guy named Tim Keller. If you're a sermon listener to go to a Redeemer Presbyterian Church or Tim Keller and listen to his sermons. But he gave this, this piece in this sermon. See, it is Jesus' intention that through our witness, the world be transformed. This is what Keller says. And I kind of you know, affiliate with what he was saying. He says, you know, sometimes I'm watching the news, sometimes I'm watching TV, and someone will get up and they'll say something about, and this is what it means to be a Christian, and he says, they're just stupid. And he said, if I had a pen and someone would give me a contract that I could resign from Christianity right there at that moment, I would do so, because if I have to affiliate with that, I don't want to be part of Christianity anymore. The point being, of course, <clears throat> nobody 
has done any more defamation to the name of Jesus than the Christians. No one has represented Christ more poorly than the Christians. And yet, without any hesitation, the Lord says to us, you are my witnesses. You are the pathway to which my word will be taken to the ends of the earth. You are the way through which the world will change by my Holy Spirit. And Peter knew that to be true. He knew that to be true. And he also knew that to be able to spread the faith, to do the mission that we were put, put, put in front of us, we must be enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus says to us all, go. He does. He says, go, make, you know, baptize everyone in all the earth. Go make disciples and people all the earth. But he does not say, go first. That's really important. He does not tell us to go first. God doesn't send us on a mission without undergirding us with the, the abilities, with the resources that we're going to need to see the mission through. I had one of the most blessed conversations right there last week that I've ever been involved in. <clears throat> Following one of our services, one of you who works in the construction industry came up to me and said this. I, I had talked, you probably don't remember, but I had talked in the middle of the sermon about how our faith needs to be like that expanding bubbles, you know, that you put too much uh, dishwasher liquid in and it bubbles up, kind of like on a sitcom and just bubbles throughout the whole house. And our faith expansion needs to be like this. And I had this young man come up to me. He says, Mike, I got to tell you this story. He wasn't telling me to be proud. He was just telling me because he'd never done anything like this. He says, you know, this week I work in construction and we're down in the basement and we got, you know, we've got guys put up insulation. We've got people pounding nails. We've got people running gas pipe. We've got all this stuff going on. And, of course, we're guys, so we start talking about things. We talk a lot of things, but I have to tell you, the basement of a home that's being built is often not a worshipful experience. I've worked in construction. I concur. But that doesn't mean it's always not a worshipful experience. He says, you know, a guy started talking about church. And he says, I'm not going to any church where some guy, you know, that's me, stands up above us and points down at us and tells us how horrible our life is and how we got to get it right or we're not going to go to heaven. And this man who'd, been, who'd received Christ in our church not so many years ago said, Mike, something within me just came out. And I said to him, that is not the Jesus that we are taught of in our church. And you should come see what that's about. Now that's about as far out on the ice as he's ever gone. He was an enthusiastic follower. And, his, and his, the completion of his following started happening. Because at the same time, not so long ago, I had a conversation with one of you that's really struggling. Uh, well, actually, you don't go to this church, so it's okay, I can tell this story. I, I, with a friend here in town who says, you know, Mike, I have this office situation that's just, just saturated with evil. There are bickering and backfighting and backstabbing and affairs, and I really need to speak into that, but I don't have the strength, and I can't even imagine how to do that. I am not equipped to speak into that. And to her I said, you know, you're not yet. If you feel that way, you're not yet equipped. But you're getting ready to stand up. You're getting ready to stand up just like Peter does. You see, Jesus doesn't say go first. He says come first. He says come to me first. First come to Jesus. Because ours is to follow and his is to fill. Look what it says in Acts chapter 2. It doesn't say that a few of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. It says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Now, we're saying tongues there, but remember, this is words that human beings there could understand. What the Lord gives us today when he fills us with the Holy Spirit is the ability to speak the tongue of those who need to hear the word so that they might hear it clearly and that Christ might speak to them through you. The Spirit at Pentecost enabled Peter to follow Jesus completely and he stood up and he became the first and primary minister of the church. That same Spirit enables you and I today. Now preparing to stand up demands choice. 
We have to choose him over I because that changes every situation. This is not a motivational speak, speech. This is not telling you to have more courage. You don't have to have any courage. You just have to prepare for Christ to give you the courage you need. You just have to prepare for Christ to give you the words you need. I'm not telling you to go out and start preaching away. If Jesus needs you to preach away, you'll know it if you're being faithful because it's just going to come out of your mouth. Peter, like we should, waits expectantly in Jerusalem for the Spirit to come. We wait expectantly before our life situation. I mean, Peter's right there in Jerusalem where he's going to come out of the, come, come out of the preaching, the fearfulness closet, and here we are standing right before our life situation preparing. Now, standing for Peter is not his idea. It's really not even a good idea. You know, 50 days earlier, the same guy got up and gave the same message. A different guy got up and gave the same message, and they killed him. This isn't a good idea to stand up in Jerusalem. And it's not Peter's idea. It's Jesus' idea. But standing for him is spirit-enabled. Peter's baptized and enabled in Jerusalem that morning, and upon him the church is founded. There is a movement that started that day that no matter how bad we are at doing our job, it cannot be stopped. No matter how bad we sit in, down and do nothing about this, the church, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, cannot be stopped because the Lord always finds himself a witness in the place he needs a witness. But we too are able, just like Peter, we are enabled to stand. We are enabled to stand upon our witness and life will be changed and lives will be changed when we just ask for the Holy Spirit. Not, not sit down and you know, write a note at your kitchen table and say, i got to get a sermon ready because my neighbor's got all this problem. Just pray, God, give me the words and let me speak into that because whatever that person needs, the Lord, this is not magic. This is the Holy Spirit. The Lord will give you what it is that you need. Now, here's the thing, and don't forget this. Because once Peter stood up, he stayed up. He never got down again. Once he stood up, he stayed up. And he did ministry for over 30 years until finally the persecution caught up to him and he was killed. And for the next several weeks, this great minister of our faith will be challenging us through the preaching and, and, and leadership of, of, of the scriptures and, and the Holy Spirit and, and your pastors. And so the questions are simple. Are you preparing? Are you preparing to make the choices necessary to prepare to stand? And are you willing, are you willing to receive the power to do it? Because here's the thing, and I'll close with this. Billy Graham has always said this, and I concur. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He goes nowhere uninvited. He goes nowhere without a receptive place to come. So are you willing, and are you able, and are you receptive to invite him in. I pray you are.